here on Kangaroo Island. People have a strong connection with the sea, with the coast. They're aware of history, the oyster harvesting that happened historically, what we've lost. A lot of it's still within recent memory for some of the older generation as well. The first oysters I remember on Kangaroo Island was in the bite of the bay. That was there for many, many years and then it's all disintegrated now. I was born on the island in 1945. I um, started an oyster lease and I, and I started from scratch. The native oysters used to attach themselves to the post in my lease and sometimes to the basket. And I was, I was actually staggered at the size of them and the amount of meat, they're very flat. My wife loved the native oysters more than the Pacific oysters, so I used to take them off the posts and then bring them home for her. I actually didn't even know about them properly until I started working here. But then now, since I've been working here, you learn heaps. Like, they're sort of a lot tastier for about three months of the year and they spawn out and yeah just sort of how they grow as well they're just completely different to a pacific talking to local oyster growers on the island uh, we discovered that they had a keen interest and, and passion for the native angazi oyster connecting with those growers we had a really deep understanding of the history of overfishing of um, native angazi oysters and it would be great to develop our own ki local restoration project Razorfish were the key inspiration for most of the design of the reef. Razorfish beds around Kangaroo Island have really become the only last point where we find those larger populations of Angazi oysters. Many people don't really know what a razor fish is if you try to explain it. So other names are razor clams or pinna. They're a large bivalve species. They're found in mostly sand and seagrass habitats. Up to 60 centimetres tall they stand. The point or the spear of the shell is embedded and anchored firmly in the seabed, but most of the shell protrudes above the seabed. And the two shells, as they raise above the seabed, provide ideal substrates for micro and macro marine organisms to settle and grow upon. So they create these really complex little ecosystems. We sort of started to realise that without razorfish, we probably wouldn't have native oysters or angazi occurring in our coastal waters. Paul explained to me these shells form a substrate or a place for the angazi oysters to grow. He asked me to actually make these forms, which are razorfish shell forms, so they're ceramic. Paul has been the brainchild of this project and it's really intuitive. It's a beautiful project that not only grows flat oysters but it's actually increases the biodiversity of an area and that's what's really astonishing about his vision for this project. What we did for starters was I made a hundred and they were put into the marine environment and so we had this sort of early feedback that, that this is working and that the Angazi oysters were actually settling, the little baby spat were settling on them. So that was really exciting. If it was, if you were making something else, you might stop like at a thousand, but because you're making for this incredible um, restoration project, it sort of keeps you going and, and um, yeah, the possibility of what can happen in native oyster reefs and being part of that conversation is like pretty exciting. Just this week we've just started putting in our beautiful ceramic razorfish forms that have been made by our ceramicist Jane Bamford. They have gone in beautifully, we've individually hand placed each one in the sand in and amongst the rocks and the different reefs so that we can um, continue some of that habitat through and create sheltered places for them to be protected. The new oyster reef restoration sites have been selected where they've got great connectivity between the natural seagrass beds that are still in place in, across Nepean Bay and also some spots that are adjacent to rocky reef habitat that's in there as well. So we've managed to increase the habitat across that whole space and in, improve habitat for fish species. 
it really started right back in the beginning, talking to local oyster growers, commercial fishers, recreational fishers. It was about being as inclusive in terms of, you know, valuing their observations, their knowledge, their skills, and bringing that into our project. It takes someone who's willing to work outside the box to actually work with an artist or a designer to use a different material and um, like it's incredible that you've got the funding from the Australia Council who will actually fund this cross-disciplinary collaborative project where an artist works with a marine biologist to make substrate for a regeneration project. I mean that's pretty astonishing for starters. When, when we dropped it out there I was Got all a bit excited, you know, you got to take a bit of pride out of it as well, which is cool. You know, telling if people ask about it, you know, you helped out in years to come when it's on. Like, oh yeah, I helped, helped that about 10 years ago, which will be cool. It's wicked, I love it. I think the guys in, in our organisation, because they've been working on it, uh, understand what it means. I'm really pleased about, you know, what we've done and, um, and just hope it's really successful, I really do. I want to stay in a place like this. I want to be able to live in a place where we're really closely connected to nature. I was fortunate in my upbringing to have those experiences and that's something that I'd like to be able to pass on to, to my son and, and his friends as the future generation of growing up on Kangaroo Island. And if we can reverse the trend of where things have been heading and start to move in a more positive direction about restoring what you know has been lost and create more richer experiences for people in the future, then I think we're on you know a good track. <laughs>